We deal with all sorts of moisture-related failures almost daily these days, and while there is an expectation that new homes and buildings are going to be dry and leak-free, unfortunately this is not the case and in fact it's far from reality, despite the continuously increasing cost of construction. We're building with more moisture-sensitive materials like engineered lumber and paper-faced interior finishes, we're insulating substantially more these days, reducing heat flow, we're designing buildings that inherently place the structure at greater exposure to weathering by eliminating overhangs and removing architectural features that shed water, and we compound all of this by installing plastic vapor barriers and impermeable materials where they should not be installed, sometimes unintentionally. In this video, we're going to talk about the top five locations where we see the biggest moisture issues in a home or building, and what you can do to prevent these failures. Let's get into it. So what do we look out for when it comes to assessing a building, either in the design phase or after the building has been constructed, post moisture failure? I'll give you a hint, it's always at the building transitions. Building transitions are locations where we have discontinuities between our control layers, that being the water, air, thermal, and vapor control layers, but most importantly, we're concerned about water and air control continuity. An opaque wall or roof assembly is very easy to design for, but what happens when we start poking holes in that assembly or where these different building geometries meet? This is where we see the majority of the problems. This leads us to the first and biggest location where we see moisture issues, and this should be an obvious one, it's windows. Windows are literal holes in your building. They need to be flashed to the weather resistive barrier or the water control air, they need to be airtight, and they need to be drained in the event that they leak. So where do the majority of leaks occur in windows? Windows tend to leak at the head or the top of the window, but all of the water ends up at the sill because of gravity, and so the majority of the deterioration that you'll see around windows will be at the sill since water will be trying to find a path out of the assembly. But a lot of windows were installed and are still being installed to this day with a critical design flaw, and that's taping the bottom flange of the windows. If you tape the bottom flange or bottom frame of the window to the surface of the weather resistive barrier, you're trapping water that leaks into the sill at the rough opening. That water has no path to drain out, and so eventually it leaks inside in the cavity. This is significantly accelerated if the rough opening was not flashed or if there wasn't a sill pan beneath the windows. This is what we call face sealing a window, and it's a highly risky building condition that doesn't have any forgiveness if there is a leaky window, a failed gasket, or an improper flashing. Instead, slope the rough opening at the sill to the exterior to facilitate drainage at this location. Then, coat the rough opening with a fluid applied flashing or flashing tape that's integrated into the weather resistive barrier for one monolithic water control layer. Install the windows on shims within the flashed rough opening, flashing and sealing the flanges only at the jam and at the head, leaving the bottom flange completely unsealed so that water may drain out, and integrating it with the weather resistive barrier on the exterior walls. Then, at the window head, we want to install a metal head flashing or drip cap with a nice hemmed drip to kick water away from the top of the windows. And then we want to make sure that the head flashing has some end dams to properly shed water away from the edges of the window. Then we seal the window on all four sides on the interior. Install a ventilated drainage gap between your cladding and the WRB and you'll have a very durable assembly that's unlikely to leak and even if it does leak, you won't be affected by it. The next location where we see tons of moisture issues also should be no surprise to anyone, and that's in basement walls, both in new and existing buildings. Water intrusion is such a common problem with basements, and it stems from a misunderstanding of waterproofing and drainage. Waterproofing should never be the one thing that you rely on to keep your basement dry. It should be the last line of defense. The buildup of water around the foundation exerts what we call hydrostatic pressure against the foundation walls, which is the weight of water pressing against the building and forcing its way inside through any small cracks, gaps, or penetrations. Well, why can't you just waterproof the interior side with a coating? It's simply not reliable and doesn't address the core problem. It's a band-aid. You need drainage in the form of a gap between the surface of the waterproofing and the backfilled soils to alleviate hydrostatic pressure against the walls. We want water that finds a path around the foundation to be drained quickly to a perimeter drain and directed away from the foundation, and we want to drain surface water away from the foundation before it has a chance to become subsurface water and groundwater. And this is addressed by providing gutters to drain the roof, with downspouts that lead to leaders or are discharged to locations far away from the foundation so that those walls are not challenged during a precipitation event. Drainage is the key to keeping a basement dry, and the waterproofing is there so that the water doesn't get readily absorbed by that concrete. 
We like to address this by installing a dimple mat around the foundation walls, but you could also install the dimple mat on the interior side if you were remodeling a basement to address drainage from the interior by directing water that leaks through those foundation walls to an interior perimeter drain that's discharged to sump pumps. This is a very common strategy that we use successfully to retrofit basements and other below grade structures. The next location where we see a ton of problems, especially on modern homes and commercial buildings, as well as in some historic buildings, is at parapet walls. Flat and low sloped roofs commonly terminate at a parapet wall, which is just an extension of the exterior wall. They do have their uses beyond just aesthetics, such as to reduce the effects of wind uplift forces, but as you can imagine, these are unbelievably leaky due to the level of exposure that they receive to the outdoor environment, and we often see failures associated with bulk water leaks and air leakage condensation in these systems. We actually have a whole video dedicated to just parapet detailing, which you can go and watch up here. But parapet walls typically fail when we have a capstone or a coping that leaks into the space below. We need to provide flashing beneath that coping that's flashed to the exterior walls and to the flat roof membrane so that we have one monolithic water control layer from the roof up onto the parapet and down onto the exterior walls. But that's not the only problem that we have around parapets. The roof membrane termination is left exposed on the surface of the parapet wall or is just sealed or cocked to protect that joint. While this is a manufacturer approved detail in many cases, it's far from best practice and it won't set the building up for success as heat and ultraviolet light from sun exposure will deteriorate that sealant over time. We want to protect that joint with a piece of counter flashing with a drip to direct water away from this location, and ideally we would want that counter flashing to be tied back to the coping. But we're not done yet though. We also have to deal with air leakage condensation in parapets, and that's almost always from air leaking into the parapet from the interior where the bottom plate sits on top of the roof deck. This location is notorious for air leakage, and so it's best practice to lap the air barrier membrane on top of the roof down over the weather resistive barrier at this location to completely uncouple the parapet framing from the roof and wall framing below, as moisture laden air from the interior can migrate up into the parapet and find a condensing surface. The next location where we see a ton of problems also happens to be on roofs, and that's at sidewall transitions. We need to make sure that we have proper step flashings and counter flashings to direct water away from these intersections between the roof and the walls, as things can go wrong very quickly if there's water intrusion at this joint. The bright side is that you'll know pretty quickly if you do have a problem, but to this day, we still see step flashings and counter flashings omitted from this location. More often it's the counter flashing that's omitted, but we need the counter flashing over the step flashing to ensure that water that drains behind the wall is directed over the step flashing and not behind the step flashing. Otherwise, it now has a path to get inside. Now, the counter flashing doesn't necessarily have to be anything special. You could just use a piece of highly aggressive flashing tape or liquid applied flashing at this location to seal the top of that joint, shingling the weather resistive barrier over that as well. Or you could go with a traditional two piece step flashing and counter flashing, which is probably what you'll need if you have something like a stone veneer or a stucco on that sidewall. These step flashing and counter flashing details will also slightly vary depending on the type of roof covering that you select. For example, it's going to look very different on a metal roof or tile roof than it would for a standard asphalt shingle roof, and you'll need to make sure that you're taking into account how those materials are transitioned. We also want to make sure that we're providing a kickout flashing where the step flashing meets the gutter to direct water away from the walls and to the gutter. This is also a location where we see a ton of problems as water just sort of runs off and drains down the surface of the adjacent wall, and that can cause cause a ton of rot problems if that wall isn't properly drained. You should also ensure that the wall assembly behind the kickout flashing is flashed and completely watertight before framing out the intersecting roof at this location. Finally, our last location where we tend to see a lot of problems are in crawl spaces, particularly in semi-vented or ventilated crawl spaces. We actually just did a video on this topic a couple of weeks ago, which you can go and watch up here. But the problem with crawl spaces that are not located within the condition space is that we get a bunch of air from the exterior migrating into this interstitial space where we have no control over the environmental conditions. And that outside air can often bring with it humidity. That warm, humid air from the outside migrates to the inside of the crawl space, especially especially if we're readily letting it in through crawl space vents. It's cooler inside the crawl space, and it's even cooler if we're air conditioning the interior space, and that warm, moisture-laden air tends to condense on the underside of the subfloor. Those condensation drips cause a ton of rot and mold in our floor structure, and we often see insulation bats falling down in these types of crawl spaces. 
In the wintertime when it's colder, we tend to see condensation form on the underside of the floor joists. So we want to condition our crawl spaces so that they're insulated, air sealed, and waterproofed, and so that they're part of the interior shell and receiving conditioned air just like a basement. If we have to have a vented crawl space, we want to make sure that we're completely uncoupling the floor system from the crawl space with an air barrier so that we don't get moisture-laden air migrating up into the floor assembly from the unconditioned crawl space. Typically, we accomplish this by using foil-faced rigid insulation with taped or sealed joints. Rigid insulation will provide the benefits of an air barrier, a vapor retarder, and will help to bolster the thermal resistance of the floor system. It's also much lighter than hauling a bunch of plywood or OSB down into this space and fastening it to the underside of the joists. You also need to make sure that the ductwork and the HVAC system is completely located within the conditioned space. You cannot run your ductwork in an unconditioned crawl space. Again, go and watch that video we just put out about conditioned crawl spaces. Now, of course, this isn't an extensive list of all the moisture problems that we see. That would likely take up an entire year to get through, but these are the big ones, the common ones that we tend to deal with, and if you can address these and understand the reasoning to why these locations are at a higher risk of failure, you'll be in a better place to address them in the future preemptively. If you found this video helpful, make sure to leave a like, and subscribe for more weekly building science videos, and head over to our website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.